Well, Charles, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who we named our firstborn after, once said this, we have worked, we have even worked hard, but the question comes to us, what have we worked for? Who has been our master? With what object have we toiled? When the end of our life comes, what will we have worked for? What did we work for? Was Christ the master that we worked for? The object we used as we toiled, was it the two-edged sword, the word of God? Also, what was our attitude as we worked? These are really great questions, especially as we consider serving. In fact, in this session, we're going to be looking at lessons learned from Tabitha, or her name is translated Dorcas, a serving sister. And so we're going to answer five questions. We're going to answer, first of all, who should serve, why do we serve, when do we serve, how do we serve, and what attitude do we have as we serve? And this is all talking about serving the Lord. And the answers will be in the form of the acrostic works. But they're, like I said, as all sessions, they're not in order. And as I mentioned, we'll use other passages besides Acts 9. But let's look at the text first of all at hand, Acts 9, 36, which is the story about this dear woman, this serving sister. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Uh, but it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them, and when he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Now, a little bit about Joppa. It's 35 miles northwest of Jerusalem. It was a walled city, at, like most of the New Testament cities were. I think it's funny when we, you know, we're talking about building a wall in the biblical world. All cities had walls around them. It's just, you know, to protect, right? But uh, this was a beautiful city, and it was known for, actually, its name was uh, translated sunlight, because when the sun would come down and reflect off the buildings, it gave uh, a beautiful picture as it reflected the sun. Um, Joppa was, as we know, the house of Simon, uh, the tanner. Remember, Simon stayed there many days. And remember when he was on the rooftop is when he received the vision. A great sheet uh, was come down from heaven and there was all kinds of four-footed creeping things and fowls. And that's when Jesus said, you know, uh, eat, eat Simon. And he said, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. And so the whole idea, he was calling him to start serving the Gentiles. The Gentiles as well as the Jews were accepted by God. Um, and also, it was the home of Tabitha, or Dorcas. And it says here that this woman was full of good deeds, charitable deeds. Now, we really don't know a lot about Dorcas. The Bible tells us very little about her background. But it's more than likely that Dorcas was a woman of great wealth. Or at least she had connections with people who were wealthy. Uh, she may have been one of the early converts of Philip the Evangelist because he was the one that established the church at Joppa. And so it's very possible that Philip was responsible for sharing the gospel with her. It's also worthy noting that Luke records here in Acts that Dorcas was full of good works. She was full of good works. And so ladies, since we're answering the question and talking about works, and especially works that we as women do, I would like to remind you of the three main passages about women and the works that we should be involved in. You can either turn to them or just listen, uh, whichever you would prefer to do. But one of the passages that deals with works that we as women should do is 1 Timothy 5, 9 and 10. It says, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number unless she's been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. And here's her good works. 
She brings up children. She lodges strangers. She washes the saints' feet. And she relieves the afflicted. And she follows diligently after every good work. And then, of course, we're all familiar with Titus 2, 3 to 5, which is the other passage that deals with things that we as women should be doing. The old women, they are to be reverent. That would be me. I'm old. Uh, reverent in my behavior, not a slander, not given to much wine, and teachers of good things. And then these old women are to teach young women how to be sober-minded, how to love their children, how to love their husbands, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good and obedient to their own husbands. And the whole goal is so that the word of God will not be blasphemed. And then the last passage that deals with the woman and her role and her works is the Proverbs 31 woman. Proverbs 31, it starts in verse 10, it says this, a wife of noble character who can find. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She does him good, not evil, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with her hands. She's like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servants' girls. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hands, she holds the distaff and she grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor, extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, not like in Florida, but it doesn't do that here. That's not in the Bible. But she has no fear for her household. For all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She's clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She's clothed with dignity and strength. She can laugh at the future. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household. She doesn't eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many women have done noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So those are the three passages that deal with us, especially as women and the works that we should be involved in besides using our spiritual gifts, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Now, we do not know how many of the above works from Titus, Timothy, and Proverbs that Dorcas was involved in. But whatever Dorcas was involved in, her life was full of them. This woman was not half-hearted about her labor. In fact, here in Acts, it says she was known for her charitable deeds, which means her giving to the poor. Remember, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, when you do your alms, don't let them be seen before men. And the alms there is the charitable giving to the poor. And that's why I say she was wealthy or she had some connections to people who were wealthy because she was able to use her money to help those who were less fortunate than she was. And so she was a very giving person. And we'll see in a minute, she probably had the gift of giving. It was one of her spiritual gifts. And the washing here of her body was in preparation for the burial. That's what they would do in the biblical world. So this woman Dorcas was full of good work, so much so that when she died, it was a terrible tragedy. Peter comes and he sees all these widows and they're weeping and crying and they're showing him all the things that she has made. And so, ladies, we certainly need women today who will follow the example of Dorcas, right? It might be as simple as giving food or clothing to someone in need. It might be making a phone call, sending a text, an email, uh, even a face-to-face -face visit if it is needed. I hope that you are always looking for tangible ways to be a blessing to others. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And Dorcas realized something that we should realize, and I want to make this very clear. People are not projects. People are people whom Christ has died for. And so as we serve, keep that in mind. This is not a project. This is a person that we are serving, people that Christ died for. We show love. We show compassion. 
and we look for ways to go the extra mile as we serve. So as we think about serving, we should ask the question, and I told you we're going to ask some questions here, who should serve? Who should be serving? So we're talking about this serving sister. Well, to answer the question, consider Matthew 5. You can turn there or just listen if you want. When Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Why? Because they put it on a lampstand so it can give light to all that are in the house. And then he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's the portion of scripture we talked about a while ago, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says, kingdom citizens, genuine Christians, are to be the light of the world. We're supposed to have our light shining so that men and women can see us, and by our good works, they glorify our Father who is in heaven. And now, ladies, Jesus is speaking to people on the Sermon on the Mount. His disciples are there, but also are the scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. So he's speaking to an audience of people who think they're Christians, but most of them are not. And so he's raising the standard. And so when we think about his, his, what he's saying, you are the light of the world, he's talking about what? Genuine Christian, genuine Christians, genuine kingdom citizens. So the answer to this question, who should serve? The answer is, kingdom citizens. These are the ones who serve their master, their Lord, the one they committed their life to. They are the ones who could answer Spurgeon's question, who has been your master, with the answer, my Lord. <laughs> my Lord is my master. Ladies, as we can surmise, Dorcas was a kingdom citizen. I don't think there's any question here in this passage. She was a kingdom citizen. As we think about what Jesus is saying here, she did let her light shine before men, right? They did see her good work, so much so that there's, there was a lot of people surrounding her when she died. She must have had quite a ministry there. Now, when Jesus says we're to let our light shine, uh, you know what I have found? We often think that that's the job of the pastor, Right? or the pastor's wife. But ladies, every one of you in this room that has committed your life to the Lordship of Christ, you are a kingdom citizen, and you should be letting your light shine before men. Each of us is individually responsible for using our spiritual gifts. Christ saved you, and he's ordained for you before the foundation of the world works, good works that you each individually should be doing. And so we need to be using those gifts for his glory. Uh, remember, when you stand before the Lord, you're not going to be standing there holding the hand of somebody else, right? You're going to stand individually. It was said of John the Baptist, he was a burning and a shining light. And he was willing to rejoice, a time to rejoice in his light. Does that describe you? Are you a burning and a shining light? Does the world see your good works? Do they know you're a kingdom citizen? Do they know why you're serving? Do they know who you're serving? Paul tells the church at Philippi, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Why? So that you'll be blameless, harmless children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So that behooves us as women, right? No murmuring. No complaining. By the way, I heard some in the bathroom all ago, but you didn't know I was in the stall, so I heard your, I heard your murmuring. I heard your murmuring. In fact, I heard about a speaker one time. This really happened. I won't tell you who it was, but she was actually in the toilet when some of the ladies from the conference came into the bathroom, and they were actually murmuring about her speaking. And she came out of the stall, and she said, I heard what you said. So, you know, uh, that, but you weren't murmuring about me, but you were murmuring about something. But ladies, what, what good does it do if we offer the world murmuring and complaining? It doesn't let our light shine before men, right? So they can see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Listen, in order for you to let your light shine before men, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. You need to be busy for the Lord. Don't isolate yourself in your home with all your technology and think that you are being light above the light to the world by posting some poem or scripture verse on Facebook or Instagram to your 6,000 friends. You got to get out. Meet people. Invest your time and energy into relationships. 
My friend, the time is short, and if you and I are going to make a difference, we must do it now. Dorcas was around people, right? Evidenced by all the women standing over her body and showing Peter all the things she made while she was alive with him. She got involved in people's lives. If you're going to be a serving sister, you've got to get involved in people. That's one of the things that has really blown my mind during the pandemic last year. How many people isolating themselves in their homes? Ladies, the Bible says, a man who isolates himself brings himself to destruction, and we're seeing it. 26% increase in suicide. People are depressed. They're anxious. They're fearful. God didn't intend for us to sit at home. <laughs> he intends us to be out and to be ministering to people. You might say, well, Susan, why should I let my light shine before men? Well, Jesus says so they can see our good works. Those good works in Timothy, Titus, Proverbs 31, but it also includes the works, the fruit of the Spirit, sharing the gospel, living out the Word of God. It would also include using your spiritual gifts, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. Ladies, as men and women see our good works, the glory doesn't go to us, right? They see our good works, which what does what? Not glorify us. It glorifies our Father who is in heaven. So this is the answer to why we serve. Why do we serve? We do this to revere the Lord's name. This is the R on your acrostic. Ladies, the reason that you serve, the reason I stand up here and teach for the Lord's name, to honor, to glorify his name. In fact, in Titus 2, where it says that old women are to teach young women, all those things, you know, the reason Paul gives Titus there, why we do this, so that God's name isn't blasphemed, so that his name is honored revered. So as people look at us as Christian women and they see us living out, loving our husbands, loving our children, being pure, being keepers at home, being good, being submissive to our own husbands, it adorns the doctrine of God and makes it attractive and it puts him on display. And then they go, you know what? You say you're a Christian. I see you're a Christian. I want, I want what you have. I want what you have. Ladies, we want to honor the Lord's name. Unbelievers don't have that motive of giving glory to God in their work. They glorify what? Themselves. They promote themselves. They have another master, and it's usually themselves. But ladies, we put God on display. As the psalmist would say, not unto us, O Lord, but unto your name be the glory, right? We want to glorify him. And that's the wonderful result of a faithful kingdom citizen who's living out a life of light and salt, we put the Father on display. Ladies, don't you want to make the world thirsty? <laughs> we're not only the light of the world, we're the salt, right? We're the salt of the earth, so we want to make people thirsty for Christ. But we're not going to make them thirsty if we don't get out and serve and get involved in people's lives. In fact, Peter himself said in 1 Peter 2.12, he says, have your conduct honorable. Make your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, the pagans. So even though if they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works glorify your Father who is in heaven, right? So even though people hate us, unbelievers hate us, and they speak evil of us, they're going to look at our good works and say, mm, you know, she's got, she looks like the real deal. And uh, they glorify our Father who is in heaven. Peter, who wrote that, remember, was the one who raised, raised Dorcas from the dead, which was another good work, and it glorified the Lord so much that people believed in the Lord. Peter had the power to raise the dead, which is one of the apostolic gifts, and he raised Dorcas from the dead, and it said, by this work, many believed in the Lord and came to faith in Christ. Jesus also says in John 15, 8, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so will you be my disciples. Ladies, both of these verses speak to the fact that our works glorify our Father by putting him on display. In fact, in the physical sense, if we were to turn out all the lights right now, it would be dark in here, right? But if I had somebody turn them back on, when the lights go on, it doesn't illumine the lights. It illumines what? All of you. The same it is with us. We don't do our good works to draw attention to ourselves, right? But to draw attention to our Father in heaven. We want to glorify him. Well, Dorcas glorified God by her service, didn't she? 
In fact, so much so, the women were deeply distressed when she died, and Peter even felt a need to raise her from the dead. This woman impacted many lives with the deeds that she did for the kingdom of God and his glory. Now, included in this reverence for God as a reason for serving would be that God created you for good works. And ladies, by fulfilling what he's called you to do, you honor his name. Paul says very clearly in Ephesians, for by grace you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then he says something very interesting. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Ladies, Paul is very clear. We're saved by not works, right? but by faith. But works prove our faith. Like James says, faith without works is dead. And Paul says, we're his workmanship. We're his poem. We're his piece of art, so to speak. And he's created us for good works that we should walk in them. Are you doing those works? Do you know what works you're supposed to be doing? Do you know why God saved you? He didn't save you to sit at home and twiddle your thumbs and eat chocolate all day. He didn't save you to do that. In fact, Paul says to Titus, he gave himself for us, redeemed us out of every lawless deed and purified himself a people of his own. Listen very carefully. Those that will be zealous for good works. Are you zealous for good works? That's why God saved you. He saved you so that you would perform good works for his glory. Ladies, if you're in the habit of serving and using your gifts... Do you know you're now fulfilling the good works that God has designed for you? God ordained works for Dorcas to do, and he's ordained certain works for you to do. Do you know what they are? Are you doing them? I hope so. Another question we should consider is this. When do we serve? When do we serve? You might say, Susan, my life is so busy. I don't have time to be serving the kingdom of God. I've got kids, I've got a house to run, I've got a husband that doesn't help. <laughs> Did you know you're already serving? Did you listen to Proverbs 31? This woman, you know, stays up late, gets up early. You know, she's constantly working, right? And her husband wasn't helping either. He was known in, in the gates. He was sitting in the gates. I don't know what he was doing there, but he was in the gates. <laughs> Ladies, we die daily, don't we? We really die daily. I was telling someone the other day, I was cooking my husband's dinner, and, um, you know, sometimes you, that little flesh gets in there. I go, well, how does he get to sit down while I'm cooking dinner, you know? And then I quickly reminded myself, just do what you ought to do and get your mind back under control, you know? So, but that is part of my job, isn't it? And so we delight in that. That's part of our good, good works. The Christian life is one of taking up your cross and dying daily. And Dorcas was evidently known for her constant giving of herself. So the answer is, when we ask the question, when should we serve, is the O on your acrostic. It's ongoing. <laughs> Sorry, ladies, it never stops. <laughs> it's ongoing. In fact, Paul says to Titus, he says, be careful to maintain good works. You know what the word maintain means? <laughs> Keep on practicing them. You never stop serving the Lord. You never stop. Ladies, we should be always looking for ways to serve. We don't take a break from his lordship. We live for others. We do not live for ourselves. So when I wake up in the morning, I should be thinking, how can I be a blessing to someone rather than how can I get someone to serve me, right? Remember what Jesus said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And ladies, as we go throughout our day, that should be the foremost thing on our mind. As Jesus went about, he went about doing good. He, he didn't even let his left hand know what his right hand was doing. And that's what we should be doing. So if my service to the Lord is ongoing, then how in the world do I do this? How do I serve? This is another question. How do I serve? By using your spiritual gifts. This is the S on your acrostic. Spiritual gifts are how you serve. Spiritual gifts are how we serve. Now, this might be foreign to you. You might say, what are you talking about, spiritual gifts? Maybe you don't even know what spiritual gifts are. You need to find out. 
We don't have time. I have a whole teaching on that. You can get on YouTube and listen to it. But there are four major passages regarding our spiritual gifts. Let me give them to you. Romans 12, 4 to 8. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. 1 Peter 4, 9 to 11. So Romans 12, 4 to 8. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, and 1 Peter 4, 9 through 11. Now, there are spiritual gift tests out there. I don't recommend most of them. There are a few of them that are good, but I don't think the New Testament stinks took a test. <laughs> hey, Peter. Hey, Paul. Where's that spiritual gift test? I don't know what my spiritual gifts are. Could you please give me that test? I don't know what my are. But we do know when we're saved, the Holy Spirit gives to each one severally as he will. So some of you have maybe one spiritual gift. Some of you may have several. I met someone that I think has every spiritual gift. Uh, and that's, that's quite an endowment. That's quite a responsibility they have. You might say, well, how do, you know what my, how do I know what my spiritual gifts are, Susan? Well, I think, well, what, are, what are you loved to do? Where are you drawn to? Uh, what, you know, what impels you? Um, for me, it was pretty simple. I, after God saved me, I um, all of a sudden had a passion for the word that I'd never had before. I used to read it because, you know, a chapter a day kept the devil away. But in my case, it never kept him away because I just kept sinning worse and worse. And so it didn't work. But after I got saved, after the Lord saved me, then things changed. And I want to know the Bible. So while my husband was in seminary all day, I was just studying and memorizing. I just wanted to understand it and learn it. And then when he graduated from seminary and moved back to Oklahoma, I was like, well, I want to, I want to tell somebody all this stuff. I want to teach. I want to, how do I do that? So I took some classes on how to teach and I took a little bit of Greek and started memorizing scripture. And so my main gifts are teaching, prophecy, not in the sense of foretelling the future, but prophecy in the sense of just heralding the truth and exhortation. Uh, I have a desire to help women. I want to see women as I see them getting off the track. I want to pull them back in and, and help them get back on track spiritually. And so another way is not just by what you're compelled to do. Ask your husband. Uh, what does he think your gifts are? Ask your closest friend. Um, I, you know, I've traveled with Debbie now for uh, over 20 years, and I can tell you exactly what her gifts are. Mercy and giving and serving. Those are her top gifts. How do I know that? I, I just watch her. And I watch her life and where she's gifted. And you can be around somebody for a while, and you can uh, see where their spiritual gifts are lie. Also, once you know what your spiritual gifts are, I think you should excel in them. You should sharpen them. I'm always trying to learn more, understand the scripture more, uh, learn more about how to help people. Ladies, we don't want to become status quo. We want to grow in our spiritual gifts, and we want to sharpen them for the glory of God and for his kingdom. As I mentioned, we know that the Holy Spirit gives to each of us at least one gift. Now, from this brief passage in Acts regarding Dorcas, we can surmise she had these gifts. She must have had the gifts of helps, right? Because she helped all these women. She had the gift of mercy, evidently, and giving. Because she would have not been able to give to all these people without having some kind of financial ability. So we can surmise even from that. You can look at Paul. You can look at Peter and know they had the what? The gift of teaching, the gift of preaching. Uh, and so you can surmise from that. Barnabas, he was the son of comfort. So he must have had the gift of encouragement. And so it doesn't take long. And I, I do have a spiritual gift test, not that I wrote, but one that I think it is helpful if you're still having uh, trouble with that. You can email me and I'll send that to you. To you. Now, what attitude should we have as we serve? So we know who should be serving, right? A kingdom citizen. We know how long we should be serving forever till we get to heaven, right? It's ongoing. The goal is to glorify the Lord, to revere him. But what attitude? Love, right? This is the W on your acrostic. We serve with love. We serve with love. Ladies, Paul is very clear in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am what? A sounding clang or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and have not love, I am nothing. And even if I give my body to be burned and I do not have love, I am nothing. I am nothing. 
Listen, as you go and use your spiritual gifts, people are going to know if you love them or not. They're going to tell, they're going to know if you're doing it out of duty or delight. They're going to know. And God knows. God knows why you're serving. Are you serving? What are your motives? Is it to glorify yourself? Is it to promote yourself? Uh, is it to honor him? Is it because you love God and you want to give back? He's died for you. He paid for your sins. You have an inheritance in heaven. Do you want to give him back what you owe him? And so do you serve with love? Ladies, God knows if you're faking it, and the people that you're serving will know if you're faking it. I remember when I first became a believer, I had several things I had to really start working on. My temper, and one was submission to my husband. And I remember when I started learning, that, okay, this is really freeing. I need to really hone in on this and get better at this. And so outwardly I was, and my husband used to say, you're submitting outwardly, but you're sitting down on the inside. And I was like, how does he know that? You know, <laughs> how did he know that? And... Uh, so I wasn't quite there yet, but uh, he knew it, and he that's good. He's my husband. He should know it. But, you know, God knows. God knows if we have the right attitude. And so maybe you need to repent. You know what your spiritual gifts are, and you are using them, but you don't have the right attitude, the right motive. You're maybe out to, you know, promote yourself like the Pharisees. They want to be seen of others. Ladies, we need to repent of these attitudes, but we need to love others and love God. In fact, Peter, Peter, when he writes, this is an interesting passage that we would do well to think about. I'll give you this because um, I want to give you a couple attitudes that he mentions that should be present. In 1 Peter 4, he says, we're to be hospitable with, to each other without grumbling. <laughs> and then he says, as each one has received a gift, because you've all received at least one spiritual gift, minister it to each other as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as if God is speaking. That's why it's terrifying to be a teacher. <laughs> if you have a speaking gift, you better be speaking as if God is speaking. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability that God gives, that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So he lists five attitudes, if you caught those, that must be present as we serve. No complaining. No complaining, ladies. Whoever was murmuring in the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> servant's heart. Servant's heart. Thirdly, an attitude is unto the Lord. He said we do it as unto the Lord. And we serve with the ability God gives us. You don't try to serve in your own strength. It will not work. It will not work. In fact, people have often told me, I don't know how you do all you do. I go, I don't do all I do. God helps me do what I do. I serve with the ability God gives me. That's it. I can't do it within and of myself. And number five, an attitude of glorifying God. Peter says that God may be glorified in all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So those are the attitudes that he gives that we should have. No complaining, a servant's heart. Attitude is to the Lord, serving with the ability God gives you. And an attitude of glorifying him. Think about it, ladies. If I love others, I won't complain. If I love God, I won't complain. If I love God, I'll be his slave. If I love God, I will serve as unto him. If I love God, I will serve with the ability that he gives. If I love God, it will be my deepest desire to glorify him as I serve. Dorcas was certain to have loved those she served, as seen by the sorrow exhibited when she died. You know, as a pastor's wife, I've seen many people die alone because they have no friends. <laughs> they didn't serve anybody. They didn't serve anybody. I've talked to people before that complain about, I don't have any friends, you know, woe is me. And I said, well, let me ask you, who have you reached out to in the last week or two? Nobody. I said, well, I rest my case. <laughs> a man that has friends must show himself what? Friendly. So make a pot of coffee and invite someone over to your house and start a friendship, right? Start a relationship. But Dorcas was obviously very loved by the multitude of women that were around her when she died. So what lessons can we learn from our serving sister, Dorcas? We've learned five lessons in the form of acrostic works. First of all, we serve with love. When you serve others, is it out of duty or delight? Do you serve because you love God and love others? Or are you serving because you love yourself and you want everyone to know how great or how spiritual you are or you think you are? Since we're on this topic of serving, do you meet genuine needs or are you enabling other people? Remember, that's not love. Agape love ministers to needs, not wants. 
Secondly, our service is ongoing. Just as we don't stop breathing, we don't stop serving. <laughs> Every day we die to ourselves and live for others. Are you haphazard in your serving of others? Are you dying daily? What are you living for and what are you dying for? If you've grown weary, remember the words of our brother Paul, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Knowing your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Ladies, your labor is not in vain. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love, which you've ministered to the saints and do minister, Paul says in Hebrews. Thirdly, we serve with reverence for God. That's your desire, should be your desire, to put God on display. Do you put God on display when you serve him in your home, in your church, in your community? If we were to ask your families, friends, and church members if God is glorified in your serving, what would they say? Do those closest to you see Christ in you? Or would they tell us your service is focused on yourself and the praise that you desire? Fourthly, those who serve are kingdom citizens. True as it is, God uses all people saved and lost for his purposes, right? He even used a donkey for his purposes. But those in his kingdom are the ones who are serving the master of the universe. Are you a kingdom citizen? Have you committed your life to the lordship of Christ? Is he your master? Is he your reason for living? Have you repented of your sins and embraced the life, the wonderful Savior who died to free you from the bondage of sin and death? Are you paying back what you owe him? Do you know what your gifts are? that God has given you, the things that he has ordained for you specifically before the foundation of the world. Are you using them for the glory of God? If not, why not? So to go back to Charles Spurgeon's quote, what have you worked for? God, self, or others? Who's been your master? Self, others, God, money, with what object have you toiled? Has it been the Lord, his word, and prayer? Or has it been self, man ide man's ideas, and some positive thoughts? <laughs> Frances Havergale, who wrote my favorite hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, she lost her mother when she was 11 years old. 11 years old. Her mother's final words to her were this, Fanny, dear, Pray to God to prepare you for all he is preparing for you. Have you and I, and are you and I, prepared for what God has prepared for us in this life? Do we know what he's called us to be and do, and are we using his gifts that he's given us for his glory? The song, Take My Life and Let It Be, is a song of great dedication that we're going to close with in just a minute as we think about this serving sister but before we sing that, I just want to remember, sisters, I want you to remember, don't be a sister who's seduced. Don't be known as a sister who's squabbling. But be known as a, submiss a sister who is submissive, steadfast, and serving. Okay? Okay.